So now we can proceed to the programme and our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Thiago Campante from the University of Birmingham who's going to talk to us about an ancient extrasolar system with five sub-Earth sized planets. So thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me thank once again the organizers of this ordinary meeting for inviting me here today. My name is Tiago Kempent, and today I will be talking about a truly fascinating system of five sub earth sized planets that date back to the dawn of the galaxy. So during this talk, I will combine knowledge from astroseismology, exoplanetary science, and galactic astrophysics to offer you uh, a detailed picture of this system and to present the broader implications of this sort of discovery. <coughs> so the parent star in this system is called Kepler-444. Kepler-444 is an orange dwarf. It is 25% smaller and lighter than the sun, being also the brightest and the closest multiple planet host so far detected by NASA's Kepler mission. So we have acquired a high resolution spectrum for this star using the high risk spectrograph on the Keck telescope, which shows that it has only 30% of the sun's iron content while being enhanced in alpha process elements. Now, alpha process elements, such as silicon or titanium, are mainly synthesized in type two supernovae, and they are known to be more abundant than iron in the early universe. Okay, so here, I plot a proxy for alpha element abundance versus iron abundance. And we astronomers call this metallicity. So our star, or our system, Kepler-444, is denoted by a star symbol. Blue triangles represent planet candidate host stars, and black dots correspond to stars with no detected planetary candidates. The dashed line that you see here follows the well-established galactic trend of increasing alpha enhancements with decreasing metallicity. And it marks the chemical separation between thick disk stars above the line and thin disk stars below the line. Now, the thick disk is an old structural component of the Milky Way. The thin disk, on the other hand, is a far younger component of our galaxy, and it just so happens that the sun is a member of the thin disk. And as we can see from this plot, thick disk stars are overabundant in alpha process elements relative to thin disk stars in this low metallicity regime. So being a member of the galactic thick disk, our system resides above this dividing line. Okay, so, among nearby stars, it is also known that old, low metallicity stars generally have higher velocities than younger, high metallicity stars. So here, I show a um, so-called tumor diagram displaying all exoplanet hosts for which it was possible to derive galactic space velocities relative to the sun. And our system, which is there, is, to the best of our knowledge, the exoplanet host star with the second largest peculiar velocity, only after Keptine's <coughs> star, which, by the way, falls outside the plotted range. So this is a further indication of the old age of the system. But how old exactly? Well, we'll get to that point in a minute. Moreover, uh, this system um, is a member of the Arturo stellar stream, which is a moving group of stars that belongs to the thick disk. So the origin 
of the Arcturus stream has been the matter of debate in the literature, intense debates, and it was initially thought to be of extragalactic origin as the result of a merger uh, event. However, its member stars are chemically similar to thick disk field stars, which in turn have abundance properties that differ uh, from those of satellite galaxies in the local group. So consequently, the stream started being interpreted as arising from dynamical perturbations within our galaxy. Okay, so a fainter companion, you can see it here, was visually detected on the Hyrus God camera at an angular separation of 1.8 seconds, and that means it is unresolved at Kepler observations. So what we did was to conduct high resolution imaging, that's what you see here, to determine the amount of dilution of the Kepler light curve due to the presence of this companion, which was unexpected. Uh, <clears throat> the two components in the system are co-moving, as implied by their systemic radial uh, velocity, and after cross-correlating the spectrum of the secondary component with that of a template red dwarf, we found that it in fact comprises two red dwarfs. So this little dot corresponds to two stars. This means that Kepler 444 is the primary star, that is the brightest star in a hierarchical triple system, which makes it even more interesting. Okay, so uh, before we move on, uh, I would like to let you know a bit about a particular field of astrophysics that is called astroseismology. I guess some of you are not familiar with that. So astroseismology is the study of the interior of stars by the observation and analysis of oscillations at their surfaces. And for stars such as the sun, so sun and sun-like stars, these oscillations are excited by turbulent convection in the outer layers of these stars. So what this does is to produce sound waves that get trapped in the stellar interior and make, it, make the star resonate just like a musical instrument. And we astronomers, we may observe the effects of the trapped sound indirectly by performing very precise Doppler shift measurements or else by looking at the tiny variations in the star's brightness. And our group at the University of Birmingham has been uh, playing a leading role in the seismic study of the stars and uh, of the sun and other sun-like stars. And I invite you to visit our uh, webpage in case you're interested to know a bit more about this fascinating field of astro seismology. Okay, so the the information that is contained in stellar oscillations allows the internal stellar structure to be constrained to unprecedented levels. While also allowing fundamental stellar properties, you can think of mass, radius, age, to be precisely determined. So here, in this plot, I show a sequence of power spectra. So each individual panel, you can see power versus frequency. <coughs> For solar mass stars, for a sequence of solar mass stars as observed by the Kepler satellites. And as a solar mass star gets older, so does its size increase. From being a um, main sequence star, burning hydrogen in its core, to becoming a subgiant and later on to becoming a red giant star. And at the same time, we notice how the typical frequency of its oscillations decreases. So this serves to illustrate how astroseismology can be used as a means of evaluating the evolutionary state of the star and thus its age. Okay, so just a few words about the Kepler mission because I've mentioned it a few times already. So the Kepler satellites was designed to survey a small patch in the Milky Way in the northern constellation Cygnus. So its primary goal is to discover Earth-like planets orbiting other stars 
and to estimate the rate of occurrence of such planets. And to that end, Kepler has monitored the brightness of nearly 150,000 stars. It's a lot of stars. The, the high precision photometry that is delivered by Kepler is also well suited for conducting astroseismic studies and astroseismic studies of stars that show solar like oscillations. And in fact, solar like oscillations have been detected by the Kepler mission in a few thousand, or let me say several thousand, main sequence, subgiant, and red giant stars. And this has led to a revolution in the field of astroseismology and one that is quite recent because Kepler was launched in 2009, so six years ago. Okay, so let us go back to our system, Kepler 444, don't forget that. So we detected solar-like oscillations in the flux time series of Kepler 444, and we then proceeded with the estimation of fundamental stellar properties via astroseismology by comparing, by matching the frequencies of the observed modes of oscillation. You can see a power spectrum for this star here. So by matching these modes to those returned by stellar evolutionary models. So we basically compare observations with predictions, of course. And we were able to measure the stellar radius with 2% precision, which, will, which is crucial to obtaining precise planetary radii, as we will see in a minute from transit observations. And the same analysis returned a stellar age of 11.2 billion years with 9% precision. Kepler-444 is thus the oldest known system of terrestrial sized planets. So that you have an idea, by the time Earth formed, this star and its planetary companions were already older than our planet is today. Mind blowing. Okay, so as I've mentioned earlier, Kepler's <coughs> primary goal is the detection of extrasolar planets, right? So what Kepler does is to measure periodic dips in starlights due to the transits of planets across the face of their stars. This is called the transit detection method. And 65% of all planets known to date have been detected this way. Transit observations being um, an indirect detection method are, however, only capable of providing planetary properties relative to the properties of the parent star. So specifically, all we can get from a transit observation alone is the relative size of a planet. And here resides the importance of the synergy between astroseismology and exoplanetary science, because from astroseismology we get the stellar radius, and we can convert that into an absolute planetary radius. Okay, so being capable of producing photometric observations with a precision of a few parts per million, Kepler is able to detect the transit of an Earth-sized planet across the face of a sun-like star. And in that scenario, the planet would cause a relative drop in brightness um, of one part in 10,000. That's perfectly doable with Kepler. A planet the size of Jupiter would, of course, be considerably easier to detect, causing a relative drop in brightness of one part in 100. So Kepler has successfully detected over 4,000 planet candidates <coughs> to this date. And I repeat, candidates. Not all of them have been confirmed, of which approximately 40% are in multiple planet um, systems. Okay, so shown here are the radii in units of Earth radii of all planet candidates discovered by Kepler versus their orbital periods. And the most enigmatic feature of this plot is the fact that three quarters of all planet candidates have sizes ranging from that of Earth to that of Neptune, which is nearly four times as large as Earth. 
So these planets dominate the galactic senses, but they are not represented in our solar system, which is interesting. <clears throat> okay, so the pertinent question would be to ask, well, Tiag, this is all very interesting, but how common are Earth-sized planets? So after Taking into account false positives and the incompleteness of the Kepler sample, it has been shown that at least one in six stars has an Earth-sized planet in an orbit closer than that of Mercury. Since there are about 100 billion stars in our galaxy, this means that there are at least 17 billion Earth-sized worlds out there in our galaxy alone, right? So about one-fourth of stars have a super-Earth, that is, with the radius between 1.25 and 2 Earth radii. About the same fraction of stars have a mini Neptune around it, that's with the radius between 2 and 4 Earth radii. And finally, gas giants such as Saturn or Jupiter are much less common. Okay, so once again, let's go back to our system, Kepler-444, and what we have done was to investigate the planetary and orbital properties of this system using four years of data that virtually span the entire duration of the nominal Kepler mission. And we did this by fitting a five-planet transit model <coughs> to, the transit, uh, to the Kepler data using an affine invariance MCMC algorithm. So here, I show the best fitting model as a red curve plotted over the face folded transit data for each of the five planets in the system, starting with the innermost planet at the top and finishing with the outermost planet at the bottom. Of course, you don't see any periodicity because this is face folded, but you can see the dip there. Okay, so in this figure, the sizes of the five planets in our system are compared to those of the solar system's inner planets. Let's start with Kepler 444b. Here it is. So this is the innermost planet, and its size is within two sigma of the size of Mercury. And we have measured the radius of this planet with a precision of 100 kilometers. That's how precise the measurement was. The intermediate planets, C, D, and E, are the size of Mars. And finally, the outermost planet has a size between those of Mars and Venus. So Kepler-444 expands the population of planets being found in low metallicity environments from the mini Neptunes around Captain Star and Kepler-10 super-Earths down to a, re a regime of terrestrial sized planets. Okay, so this system is also highly compact. All plant, well, you can see it here, by the way, compared to other to other Kepler systems and to the solar system also. So all planets, all five planets, orbit the parent star in less than 10 days or within 0.08 astronomical units. That's roughly one-fifth the size of Mercury's orbit. And for those of you that are not astronomers, one astronomical unit is the Sun-Earth distance. Also, um, all adjacent planet pairs in our system are close to being in exact first order mean motion resonances. It's very interesting. It tells us a lot about dynamics and, mi and migration mechanisms also. Um, so just to remind you that the only uh, solar system planet pair near such a resonance is Uranus and Neptune. Okay, so just a couple of slides now to finish my talk where I present the broader implications of this discovery. And although we are dealing with a single system, the implications, I think, are very important. So the chemical composition of stars 
hosting small planets, by small planets I mean with radar less than four Earth radar, appears to be more diverse than that of gas giant hosts, which tend to be metal rich. So this implies that terrestrial sized planets may have readily formed at earlier epochs in the universe's history when metals were more scarce. So we have just learned that Kepler 444 has or was formed when the universe was less than 20% of its current age. So this then suggests that Earth sized planets have formed throughout most of the universe's history thus providing scope for the existence of life, of ancient life, in the galaxy. Why not? OK, so <clears throat> there is also growing evidence that the critical elements for planet formation in iron-poor environments such as this are alpha process elements. I talked about them in the beginning. And we have also seen that thick disk stars are overabundant in alpha elements relative to thin disk stars in the low metallicity regime, which may explain the greater planet incidence among thick disk stars that we observe for metallicities below half that of the sun. Thus, thick disk stars were likely hosts to the first galactic planets. The discovery of an ancient system around the thick disk star Kepler 444, then not only confirms that the first planets formed very early in the history of the galaxy, but it also helps to pinpoint the beginning of what I like to call the era of planet formation. OK, so this is my last slide. I think the, the future, short term, mid term, long term, um, the future for, um, for planet hunters and astroseismologists alike is extremely promising. So with scheduled launch in 2017, just a couple of years from now, TESS <clears throat> is a planned NASA space telescope. So its primary goal will be to survey the brightest stars in the solar neighborhood for transiting planets, and TESS is expected to find more than a thousand planets that are smaller than Neptune. So we are looking forward to that, indeed. And um, if we look further ahead in time, we have Plato. So Plato is a planned European Space Agency space telescope with scheduled launch in 2024, nine years from now, but we are already working on it. Uh, and its primary goal will be to, uh, to find, obviously, and to study a large number of planetary systems with particular emphasis on the properties of terrestrial-sized planets in the habitable zone around sun-like stars. So looking for an, an Earth twin, if you will. Thank you very much. So we have a few minutes for questions. I'm sure there'll be plenty um, yeah. at the back there. How eccentric are the orbits in the system that you spoke about? Are the planets like returning comets, or are they have their orbits more circular, like the Earth? Um, the, uh, all planets have circular orbits in this in this system. Our, the, I mean, the error bars are large, but they are all consistent with circular orbits. Yes. There has been circularization. Yeah. Tom? Do you have any indication of their masses? Can you measure TTV? Uh, there is an indication for a marginal TTV for one of the planet pairs. Marginal. Um, if we would, would rely on radial velocity um, uh, measurements of the mass, it would not be feasible because even combining all the five planets in the system, we would get a semi amplitude of. 0.3 meters per second. By the way, I forgot to, to say this during my talk, but these results have been published earlier this year. Uh, you can look them in the Astrophysical Journal. Jane? How relevant do you yeah. think the um, thick disk dynamics of this star system might be to planet formation? I'm thinking of systems like Tau Ceti, which is very close and almost as old and has three or five little planets as well. I, I, don't, I don't have an idea. I mean, there has been... F 
there is ongoing follow-up work on the dynamics of the system, uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't have a, a, a detailed picture of how the, they, they got to this place and how the migration proceeded. Yeah. Actually, that's a nice talk, but I just wish to correct, if you like, a misunderstanding that you may have made, that we don't compare theoretical frequencies with observational frequencies. We have to make some sort of corrections for the unknown properties of the outer layers of these sort of yes. stars or use techniques that subtract off that effect. Yes. But we don't, we can't for this sort of star just make a direct comparison as we might be able to yes. do for more massive stars. Or Thank, white dwarfs. Yeah. Thanks for that remark. Obviously, being an astroseismologist, I'm perfectly aware of that, but I, I wanted to simplify things and uh, uh, just skip that detail. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.